last service. Maybe this may be it. This this may be somebody in this place. Maybe me. Maybe the last message I ever preach. This may be our last time to come into the house of the Lord. We may have to go to heaven on what we do today. And we can say, well, there's no drums and there's no guitar. And, and this person's not here, that person's not there. We got to go to heaven on, we got to go to heaven on what we take out of this place today. This may be the last service that we have. This may be my last message. This may be your last opportunity to hear the Word of God. Amen. Amen. I have been around a lot of people that have lived for God and lived a long time for God. And every one of them, when they fail, and I've got two or three people that are going through my mind right now that have been a part of this church and have grown, a, and grown older and gotten sick and, and, not, and before they passed away. And I would go see them either in a nursing home or in their home. And one of the last things they, they would always tell me is, I just wish I could be in one more church service. I just wish I could be back in the house of God and worship one more time. Well, here we are. Here we are. I said, here we are. And this may be the service that we have to go to heaven on. And it's important that we don't let it slide and not get something we need because we didn't have drums. Amen. I said, it, 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 we would be fools to go out of here and not be ready to meet God because we came to church service and they didn't have drums so we couldn't worship. We'd be fools. We'd be fools to walk out of here today without something in our heart from God that could give us what we need to get to the next level in God and to get the next level of victory that God would have for us today in this church service today. So why don't we just one more time while we can and while we are still able to be in the house of the Lord, why don't we just raise our hands and just worship Him. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, we worship You. You. We praise you, Lord. We praise your name. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We glorify you. We magnify you. We worship you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you everything we have. God, we give it to you today. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. We're good and thankful, God. It's good and we're thankful to be able to be in the house of the Lord today. Praise the Lord. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 12. Hallelujah. If you knew the person sitting next to you, if you knew that the person sitting next to you this was going to be their last service. I'm asking you to conduct yourself. You that are in the back and here and everywhere and whatever. If you're at home watching this on YouTube and somebody's around you is watching it and they're being intent on this, don't act like a fool. And distract them. Amen. Be courteous. Make sure those that are around you can get what they need. Because this may be the last message they ever hear. I don't know why I feel an urgency, but I feel an urgency. Maybe it's because of the title of my message. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now at that time, now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. In other words, he's going to kill him then. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side 
and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind up thy sandals. In other words, get up, get your clothes on, get your shoes on. And so he did, and he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. I want to preach to you this morning for the next few minutes, and I'll be out of here in 30 minutes or so on the subject of we are at war. We are at war. We are at war. We are not in a hobby. We, we are at war. We're at war. Amen. Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing. That scripture right there is the declaration of war for the church. But prayer was made. But prayer was made. We are at war. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. There's probably not a chapter or probably no other chapter tells of the conflict between good and evil in the Word of God than this one does here. Uh, Herod, for some reason, who was a Roman king there, he hated Christianity. He hated it. He hated, for, hated it for some reason, and, and we don't even know why he hated it, but he just hated it. He just hated church. Put it in our terms we can understand today. He just hated church, and he hated anybody that went to church, and he hated anything that the church stood for, and he hated the principles. In other words, he just hated God. He, just, he didn't like anything that had to do with God. And, and so he decided that because he had the authority, and because he could do it, he was going to wreak havoc against the church. He was going to cause them as much problem as he could. He was going to do everything in his power to destroy it and try to stop it. And so we know the story of how that what he did was that he, he took James and he chose, for some reason he chose James and, and they arrested him and they brought him in and, and the only thing they had against him was because he was a follower of Jesus Christ. And when they brought him in, they took him and they took a sword and they killed him and whether they stabbed him or cut his head off and, or whatever the case may be. And I read something the other day or heard something that said that when they killed him by the sword, that, that sometimes the swords weren't very sharp. And it would have to chop. It wasn't just one swift thing and they severed his head like a guillotine, but, but they'd chop and they'd cut him and he'd go into agony and they'd chop. And they'd chop and they would chop until finally his head would be severed from his body. And the Bible says that when he did this, when he, when he cut this Christian's head off, that all of a sudden they seen that, that Herod seen where the Jews liked it. And the Jews were, and, and put it in our, in our culture today, they were raising their fist and saying, yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah, yeah, do that, do that. And so when he saw that it made everybody happy, he said, let me grab another one. And so he grabbed Peter, and he took Peter and arrested him. And he brought him, and he put him in chains. It was the holiday weekend, uh, the process of the Easter or the Passover time, and whichever they were celebrating, uh, which side of the fence you were on. And they brought him in. And, and here's this preacher who, who has done nothing violent, nothing nothing weird other than just being a preacher and trying to live for God. And, and they bring him in, and they double chain him. They put sh double shackles on him. They put double handcuffs, double ankle braces around him. And then they bring him into the, uh, the prison. And the Bible says that when they took him in there, and then they brought him in, they, that they bound him and they put him with two chains, and, and he put him sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keeper of the door kept the prison. There he was in the innermost parts of the prison, chained up with two chains and two guards, one on each side, and a man watching the door, and Peter went to sleep. I, I don't know how he did it. I'm just going to be real honest with you. If you could have just watched them chop and gnaw the head off of James, and they said, hey, that makes everybody happy. Let's get one more. And they grab you, and they bring you in, and you're in the midst of the prison and the sounds of the prison and the smells of the prison, and they got you, and they got you double-chained with the guard on each side and a man at the door. It would be hard in your natural mind to fathom, I'm ever getting out of this. Peter went to sleep, but the Bible says that while they were doing that, the church prayed. Let's look at a couple things, if we could, here real quick. First of all, James and his brother John are the two guys who came to Jesus, who Jesus called the sons of thunder. 
And they came to Jesus, and it was them and their family that wanted to know if they could set one on each side of, of them. Said, Jesus, when you come to your throne, James and John said, we'd like to set one on one side and one on the other. Us sons of thunder, Jesus called them. Hey, you sons of thunder. Here was a son of thunder now who had just lost his head. And your mind can't help but go back to the point, to the time when they came to Jesus and said, we want to set on one hand and one on the other side of you. And Jesus looked at them and he never laughed and he never smirked. But, but in Jesus' own kind and compassionate way, he looked at him and he said, yeah. You probably can, but he said, you're going to have to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with, and you're going to have to drink of the cup that I'm willing to drink from. And I can hear probably James going, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Well, James got to do that. James got to give his life for the kingdom. He got to have his head chopped off, and, and, and he got to have that, and, and, and they were called these sons of thunders. He was, he was only named twice in Scripture. He was only named amongst the apostles, this James was, as being one of those who received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, and then again in this situation here. And, and, and Jesus said, you can do this if you can set by me, but, but uh, uh, the opposition fastened for some reason upon James and then on Peter, who was imprisoned, and and, and these two guys, there was two, you see there were two forces at war in this passage of Scripture. But in verse 5, it tells us that Peter was kept in a prison. That's one side. You see, there's one, one side that wants to put you in prison. There's one side that wants to, 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 to get you messed up. There's one side that wants to destroy you. One side wants to silence your testimony. There's one silence who doesn't want you to praise God. There's one side who wants to bind you. There's one side who wants to hinder you. There's one side that wants to stymie you. But then on the other side is the other side of the warfare where the Bible says in the church, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. The church went to prayer. Remember, Jesus it was who prayed for Peter because Jesus knew that there was coming a day. See, he told James, he said, yeah, you can... You can set by me, but you're going to have to drink of my cup and be baptized like me. But then he also told Peter one time, Peter's in prison now, and, and notice here what, what the Lord had told him earlier. He said, Simon, Simon, he said, Satan does desire you. He wants you, Peter, because he wants to sift you like wheat. He wants to break you down. He wants to grind you into fine powder. He wants to separate you. He wants to take you, and he wants to do that. But he said, Simon, he said, Satan does desire to have you. But he said, but I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. And now we see the fulfillment of that scripture was when Satan had just went to warfare with the church and he had grabbed a hold of him and he put him in prison. But they could be rest assured that, that the church was fulfilling the mission of Jesus Christ and they were praying without ceasing. Remember Jesus. You see, the, the, the enemy, the enemy uh, has some personalities. Uh, I, I just believe we need to understand some things about the enemy of our soul. Having been a young man and grown up in church, I was always asking the question of right and wrong. Can I do this and still be right? If I do this, will it make me wrong? How wrong does it have to be before it's really wrong? You mean when I stand before God, He's going to tell me this is wrong? How many else is, help me out here just for a little bit. How many has ever asked those same kind of questions? How wrong is wrong? Well, does it really have to be wrong? Does it have to be? Can, what, what is the deal here? How wrong can it really be? Let me give you a couple things here that, uh, that, that when you know when a spirit is wrong. Verse 20 it goes on and tells us how that the angel of the Lord got Peter out. 
and he got him out and he told him to get his clothes on and get up and get your coat on. And for some reason, they just walked out right past all of that. And Peter came to himself and the church was praying. And, and, and that's another message for a different time. But this morning, I'm talking about war, warfare. And we're not going to put this up, but you can just read along with me. In verse 20 of that same chapter, and Herod was highly displeased with them. I like that term, highly displeased. Let me tell you what that really means. That really means he was mad. I've never looked at my children and said, I am highly displeased with you. My children have never looked at me and said, Papa, are you highly displeased with us? Why are you highly displeased? They've never, I've never had anybody, but I have had them say, what are you mad about? <laughs> you, can tell, you can tell that he's getting highly displeased. No, that's a biblical term. Ticked off, I think would be it is a milder way of putting it. And, and we, can, we can fill in blanks that you use, I hope in a godly way, about, about that refers to when you just had all you want. When your button has been pushed. Oh. Uh, and Herod's buttons had been pushed. He'd had all this Christianity he wanted. He had had all, of, he killed him, and he thought it was going to make it good, and now he gets ready to bring Peter out here, and they go, oh, Peter's gone. How did he get gone? An angel came in and got him, and the Bible said he was just highly displeased. He had had enough. Let me explain something to you. He was angry. When something gets angry because you try to do right, that's not of God. Your enemy gets angry when you try to live for God. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, I'll preach it again. But for some reason, it seems like in this area, when people don't want to live for God, and they, they, they just, for some reason, they just stay angry at people that try to live for God. They hate it. They get angry. They can't just go away and leave it alone, but every chance they get to be angry at it, they just like a spirit of anger rears up in them, and you start talking about church, and they get angry. Nobody's done anything to them, they just get angry. They just get angry. They're just ticked, and they're upset, and they're angry, and they don't know why. They're just angry. Want to go to church with me today? You can be laughing, having a good time. And then you mention something about the preacher or something about the church or something about somebody in the church, and they just get angry. I don't even want to talk about that. They get highly displeased with you if you start talking about God. You know why? It's because we're at war. And they just identified themselves with which side they're on. Why would I get angry with somebody wanting to live right? So see, if you come to me and say, one of my children, mine or your children, that's not living for God, prayed through the Holy Ghost, why would we get angry at each other? If I came to you and said, one of my children just prayed through the Holy Ghost, and you said, I don't want to hear about that, why would you say that? We wouldn't say that because we're on the same side. But if we're not on the same side, and then we just get, ah, ah, ah. And, and I've seen it. It almost like their eyes change and their disposition changes. And, and you say, we're having a wonderful church service. Ah, I don't want to go. I wouldn't, you couldn't pay me or not. Anger. He was highly displeased. Verse 21. Verse 21 says, and, that, and upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, set upon a throne, and made an oration unto men. I read where a historian by the name of Josephus talked about him and talked about this situation. And he talked about him. And, and, and he, what he was said was that he got so upset and he was about to kill them all and he was about to wipe them all out just like he wanted to do, to, like he did to James and he wanted to do to Peter and like he did to the poor soldiers who, who guarded there. He had them killed. It meant nothing to him. Life meant nothing to him. When life don't mean anything, this is as close to political as I'm going to get. But you can't be godly and want to kill unborn babies up to the day they're born. 
You can't be godly and want that to lead you. Lead me so we can kill all of our babies and we can murder them the day before they're born. No, 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 no. No regard for life. The Bible says that the Lord told us that any time we get the opportunity to choose between life and death, we're supposed to choose life. And that he came to not just give us life, but give us life more abundantly. He puts emphasis upon living life good and having a good, happy life and doing things and being happy. He puts emphasis upon that. But the adversary of our soul puts no regard on life. No regard to human life whatsoever. He puts it out there and he throws it out. And, and Josephus said that he got up and he may, they're just about to go crazy. The, the Bible tells us this, and Josephus adds a few little narratives in it. He talks about it, and he says, he says how that, that Josephus was just a historian. He wasn't trying to be inspired of God. He was just a historian telling what, what was happening. And, and, and he, he said that they were so upset. They got nervous because Herod is coming down to Tyre and Sidon, and he was displeased with them. He was angry, and he was going to take it out on them. He was looking for somebody. And so they, they made a big deal, and they made a big party, and they said, let's get him up here, and we'll, we'll get him all dressed up fancy, and we'll put him up. And so he came in, and they, they, they were friends because they were nurtured. As the Bible says, they, their nation fed that nation, and, and that was their livelihood, and they took care of them. And you don't want to kill the golden goose. So you don't want to get Herod mad at you. We need him. We need him to like us because he don't care about us. He don't care about nobody. And all of a sudden, they said that he, he made this thing, and, and history says that he made this gown out of silver sequins of real silver and streamers. And, and when the sun, when he would step out on this balcony to give a talk that they had made special for him, and it was made out of silver sequins and shiny things, and the sun would hit on it, and it would glare. And, it, and then they went into this, they went into this, this fake adoration because they were scared of him. Church, if you get to the place, and I get to the place, and the church gets to the place, pardon my term, I don't know how, how to say it in a better way than this, but if we suck up to the world because we're scared that they might not like us and they might not accept us and we want to be accepted because we need them. Let me explain something to you. I'm not trying to be radical or crazy or anything, but I'm saying when we do that, we are no better than the people from Tyre and Sidon who got up there and went, He's a God! He's a God! He's a God! And he got up there in his shimmy-shaking suit, and he got up there looking like he was all of that, and the sun was shining on him, and he got up there and made a big old fancy speech, and they said, He's a God! He's a God! No man can speak like this! He's a God! And he gave a big speech, and he got all puffed up in himself. Yeah, they, they recognize who I am. They recognize who I am. They know who they know who I am. And in verse 21, and upon that day he arrayed in royal apparel and set upon his throne and made an oration unto them, and the people give a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not a man. And O'Herod was like, Yep, you got it. I'm the voice of a God. And God said, No, 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 no. And he said, this is true stuff. This is, not, this is not Greek mythology. This is history. This actually happened. And the Lord sent an angel that day. And when the Lord told that angel, and that angel was just sitting over there. You see, we, we don't see everything that's really going on and happening. And, and old Her Herod's up there. Oh, Lord, Lord. he's going on. And they're going, oh, he's a God. He's a God. He's a God. He's brought the voice of a God. A man can't speak like that. Look at him shimmer and shake and chime. And he's out there, and O'Hare's like, yep, that's right. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And the Lord says, that's enough of this silliness. I've watched you kill one of my people. I've seen you try to kill another one. And now you're acting like you're taking my place. And God sent that angel. And this was the most interesting way that I think i ever seen God kill anybody. God just filled him up with worms. Read it. For five days, 
History says, the historians say, that his belly began to hurt so bad that, that they had to carry him out of that place where he had, in his shimmy and shaking and shining, and he had to take that off there. He got to cramp it. I was a kid. I used to love to eat green apples and green grapes. They never bothered me. I could do it. But people say, I'm going to give you a bellyache. And I'm saying, well, they never have yet. And I just pull them old green sour grapes and, and eat them right off. Uh, but I've heard people say, man, that give me the bellyache. But I have had the bellyache before. And I know what it feels like to hurt so bad. You're just doubling over. And, and I had gallbladder before they took it out. And I know what that's like. And, man, I've had that to where I felt like I was going to die. And then you're afraid you're not going to die. And you just, ah, ah, you just buckled over, laying in the floorboard, my wife driving me to the hospital, and I'm telling her, go faster, go faster, go faster. And she said, I can't. I said, I think I'm going to die. And Herod had worms. And the worms ate him up, it said, and then he died. The Lord said, I'll teach you to give me a hard time. And just put the worms in his belly. And he lived for five miserable days until the worms just ate him up and he died. That's probably the grossest message I've ever preached. They're chopping heads off and dying of worms. Let's go have lunch. <laughs> Can you imagine the agony and the scene? that was going on in his body and in that room. Wouldn't you hate to have been a health care worker in those days that had to walk into that place with no gloves or anything and then had to take care of a man who was just dying with worms eating him up on the inside? Let me explain something to you today, church. We're at war. We're at war. If we dethrone God, we make ourselves God. And when they say in our world today, we don't need God. When politicians, and I don't, I don't want to be political, and I don't like to be politics. This is not the place, I, in my opinion, but it has to be said once in a while. We're not endorsing anybody or condemning. I'm just telling you, when a, when, a, when a politician of any ilk gets up and says that we don't need the things of God, and anybody who believes that, that abortion and, and a, a lifestyle that's contrary to the Word of God, when they say that's okay, and they say that churches are actually taking people's constitutional rights, they're saying there is a way and a law that is higher than the ways and the laws of God, and they dethrone God, they put themselves up, and God says, no, 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 it will not work. And if America chooses to dethrone God, it will not work for America either. When we don't want our currency to say in God we trust, we're taking God out of it. God will not bless America. If we dethrone God, we make ourselves go. He was destroyed by the fickle cry of the crowd. When the crowd said, he's a God, and he believed them. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you believe. So, all of that, let me apply this to where we are today. There are two, for, two major forces in the world today. And one is the world, and the other is the church. That's what the scripture says. Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church. The church and the world. The purpose of the enemy is to take from you, take from us, the gift that God has given us. We have to look at what is given, God has given us that really brings us joy. Okay, contrary to what a lot of religious people believe and what a lot of some preachers may preach, God didn't save me to make me more miserable. Well, some of you believe that. Some of you are still getting on the misery boat. I'm sorry, I ain't there. I didn't get in this saying, 
I didn't get in this thing just to be miserable. I didn't get in this thing so that I could just sit at home and, and be discouraged and despondent and never, never have any fun and never laugh. But, but I believe that when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, why in the world? Let me ask you a question. Why in the world would a king adopt a pauper's child? All right, now let me just let me give you a little theology 101 right here. This is, this is basic theology right here. The Bible says that Jesus said, You are of your father the devil. Everybody, whether we know him or not, has a father. None of us are here by supernatural conception. We all had a biological daddy and a biological mommy. There's no immaculate conceptions among us. And spiritually speaking, be, oh, this is harsh, I know. But before we come to God, we was of our father, the devil. Adam's nature, that sin. We came to this old earth because when we hear, we have a sinful nature. And the Lord talks about it being of the father, our father, the devil. And we lived like him, and we were the results of his nature, and we were the results. I was sitting there this morning drinking a cup of coffee, and I was sitting a certain way in my chair, and I said something, and my wife just looked at me and blinked. She said, you look just like your dad did when he said that, sitting in that same chair. I said, well, DNA's a funny thing. I said, I said, you look like your mom sitting there telling me that. I said, so we can't get away from it. I said, we can't get away from it. I said, we are who we are. And you want to know why I acted like I acted before I came to church and why I started living like I did when I lived out there? You know why? Because I acted like my father, the devil. I talked like him. I acted like him. I was being destroyed by him because everything he touched went south. Everything he touched was destroyed. Everything he handled. He was a thief and a robber and he came to steal and to rob and destroy and I was one of his children and I was living in his kingdom and I was acting like him and I was influenced by him and everything about me was just like him. And somebody said praise the Lord. But then one day I got churched. I come to church and I got what the Bible called the spirit of adoption. You know what that is? That's when the Lord takes you away from that father and brings you into his house and gives you the spirit of adoption. When you're baptized in his name, when you're filled with his spirit, you take upon his nature because he gives you a new nature. But the old father wants to come back once in a while through your flesh and try to reclaim you. But you've got so much of the new DNA in you that if you want to, you can override that. Key word there being if you want to. But the enemy comes to take away. So why would he bring me in? Why would he bring me in? Why would he bring me in? If you was to go to, to some third world country, I got a deal from a third world preacher the other day from Uganda, sent me a whole bunch of pictures. He's a native Ugandan. And he was showing me what he's doing over there. He has a mission for kids from 5 to 15 years old whose parents have all died from either in a, in a civil war or because of AIDS. And they're sitting on these plastic chairs in this place and he's trying to feed them and clothe them and take care of them and, and, and he's, just, he's just got all this going on in a third world country. Why would I, why would I get on an airplane, fly over there, give my money to bring that child back to this country and me with a nice house and plenty of food and a nice warm bed for him, take him and just make him stay in a shack in my backyard because that's all he deserves because that's who he is and that's where he come from. Why would I do that? Why would I go to Korea and get a child out of an orphanage? Why would I go to Vietnam or any place else? Why would I go to Springfield? Why would I go to Greene County, if my memory serves me correct, who has more children in foster care than any county in the state of Missouri? Why would I go up there and get a child out of foster care and put them out there in my shed on a dirt floor and put a plastic chair in a pot out there and tell them this is all you deserve because of who you are and where you came from, not on your life? 
If I bring them into my house and I give them my name, they get a seat at my table and they get a bed of their own and they get the same shoes as everybody else and they get the same clothes because they got the same name and that's who they are. How sick would I be to lock them in a shed because that's where they came from? What kind of heavenly... I feel the Holy Ghost in it. What kind of heavenly Father do we serve who wants to bring us in to the greatest kingdom there is, a kingdom of His name and a kingdom of His glory, and then tell me because I came out of the world, I have no right to be happy. You can't laugh because you're in my kingdom now. You can't enjoy anything because you're in my kingdom now. What a bunch of nonsense. Well, that kind of pulls some of the old sticks in the mud out, but that's just the way it is. The Lord didn't give me a family for me to be miserable. But He wants the adversary wants to come in and mess up your family. He don't want your children to be happy. He don't want your grandchildren to be happy. He don't want you to be happy. Because our families, if God put us together, if God brought us the will of God, I know it's the will of God, that if that's the will of God, why would God want you to be miserable? <laughs> I'll move right on. Financial blessings. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring you into my kingdom. Here's God sitting on his throne with all of his righteous glory. And his train fills the temple. And the cattle on a thousand hills are his. And he's in charge of all the kingdoms and all the worlds and all the finances. He put the gold in the hills and the silver in the creeks. And he said, I'm going to bring you out of that world. And I'm going to bring you into my church. And you're just going to barely survive. You're going to beg me for every crumb you get. If you make it through the winter, it's going to be just because the sparrow came by and fed you. (laughs) Now you're preaching like a prosperity preacher. No, I'm preaching like somebody who knows what kind of father I've got. And he adopted me, and he has no intention for me to sit there and be filled with anxiety. I know I've been through tough. You know what Paul said? Paul said, I know what it's like to be abound, and I know what it's like to be abased. And he said, I've learned in whatever state I'm in there with to be content. But I've learned this much, that if I will be a good steward, if I'll give God his share, and I'll be a good steward with what I have left, he will bless me with it, he'll take care of it, he'll watch over me, and he'll raise me up. God bless you for believing that. The adversary wants to destroy you financially. Yeah, you know, God gave me peace of mind. Satan wants to take that. I'm hurrying. I got a whole list of stuff, man. He gave me freedom from sin. Things that used to bind me, he took it away from me. It would be like a child coming in that had... I had a friend of mine one time that, that uh, adopted a girl, a little girl. And she'd come out of abstract poverty, just just terrible poverty. And he said she won't eat anything, but he'd set this, his wife would cook this big meal. And she'd fix a big pot roast and potatoes and homemade bread and, and carrots and everything in this big meal and all this food and green beans and all this stuff. And the little girl wouldn't eat anything but just bread and butter and a hot dog. Bread and butter and a hot dog. And he said we couldn't get her to eat anything else for the longest period of time because she had a mindset of that's all the taste she had developed in her life was bread and margarine. No butter, just margarine. Just bread and margarine and, and a hot dog, cold hot dog. He said we'd sit down there and eat, and she'd just look at it, and she said, I can't eat that. i got to have bread and butter and a hot dog. And some of us live that way. When we come to the Lord, we get full of the Holy Ghost. He breaks the chains of sin out of our life. But some of us can't grasp that. And so we go back and we pick them up because we say, that's the way I've always lived. But we're in the king's house now. And we can live free from sin. And he wants to have us, to give us assurance of salvation. But the adversary wants us to think we can't make it. 
We can't make it. But I want to tell you something, what Paul wrote and told us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Brother Raymond, give me that scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through the terror, pulling down our strongholds. Casting down. Here's what they do. Here's, here's what they do. Here's what they do. They cast down imaginations. Just stay right there with me. Imaginations. Say imagination. A lot of the stuff that we fear and a lot of the stuff we believe and a lot of stuff that we think is no more than just our imagination. Amen. Imagination. You know nobody out there really likes you. Who said that? Well, I can tell. How can you tell? Because I imagined it. Imagination. Imagination is not bad. Please don't misunderstand me. I believe I've got a good imagination. I can imagine. I can live in a fantasy world as long as well as anybody can. But I'm going to tell you something. I've got to make sure that my imaginations are not contrary to the things of God. And every high thing. This is, what our, this is what prayer, this is what our side does because this is what the enemy does to you. He gets you imagining stuff. You ain't going to make it anyway while you're trying. You didn't dot that one I or cross that one T. You thought a bad thought. You said something. And you, you just don't think you're going to make it anyway. So you imagine you're not going to make it. I can't ever measure up to this. I, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, every high thing, we don't have time to go into all this stuff. But these, these are things you need to study out. That exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Let me just explain this one thing. I don't care how many degrees somebody has or how many books they've written. And I don't care if science says science has proven the Bible wrong. No, it's just like this here. It's exalting itself up against the knowledge of God. So therefore, it's the enemy of God. And if science contradicts the Word of God, then science is wrong. I don't care how many test tubes they've got or case studies. And bring it into captivity, every thought, to the obedience of Christ. So here's what happens. The enemy comes with imagination, and they exalt things up above what we know in God. But, the, the, uh, but our prayers, our weapons, our weapons... Bring every thought into obedience to God. And verse 6, And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. When we, are, when we do what's right with God, when we are obedient to Him, it will avenge every disobedience. And how in the world did this happen in the early church? How in the world... Did this happen in the early church? Verse 5. And the church prayed. Put my opening screen back up, Brother Raymond. The church prayed. The church prayed. The church prayed. The church prayed. My opening screen, Brother Raymond. Where's it at? There it is. And when Peter was in prison, prayer was made without ceasing of the church. The church prayed, and they never stopped. They never stopped. They never stopped. They never stopped. You know, I, I, you can tell that I'm not a big workout person. I'm not a marathon runner or exercise guru. But in my younger days, I used to really like to, to do that. And not run marathons, but I used to like to work out. But I read one time that the importance of doing it every day, every day, every day, every day, every day was that if you stop one day, it undoes something like three days. So you've got to go four days to get back for that one day you missed. <laughs> Boy, it don't take long to lose your game. And you can't pray. You can't pray today and say, well, that's it. 
That's it. Because the adversary never rests. He'll always try to get in your head. He'll always try to discourage you. He'll always try to bring thoughts in. He'll always try to do things. And you've got to be diligent. You've got to be diligent. And the thing about prayer, and I'm closing with this, is the thing about prayer is it's got to become more than just a religious exercise. Because in that story it says that when Peter got out of prison and he went to Mary's house where they were having prayer meeting, that he knocked on the door and little Rhoda come to the door. And she turned around and went back and said, Peter's here. And they said, now stop it. He's in jail. Well, we've been praying all night for him. Yeah, but he's in jail. You see, it finally just became a religious exercise. But it can't become a religious exercise. It has to become an act of faith. You know, I've got the keys to my truck. And it has happened. I have went out there and it wouldn't start. Not this truck, but another truck I had. It wouldn't start. And I had to humble myself and almost crawl and ask somebody with a Ford to jump start me. But I humbled myself before the Ford. And then I traded it off. <laughs> but, but I'm not sitting here with this key saying, Brother Hubert, don't move because I'm going to need a jump today. Just in case, I'm going to stick this key in it. You know what? It don't make any difference if I'm the last one out of here. I expect this truck to start. I expect it. I expect it. Then why do we pray and not expect the knock to come to the door? Why don't the church realize we are at war? And our only weapon is prayer. And amongst a few other things. But the lesson today is we are at war. And the reason the church won was because they prayed without ceasing. And you don't know what God's doing outside these walls. But you've got to keep praying. Daniel, wasn't it Daniel who prayed for three weeks? Prayed for three weeks. And when the angel showed up, the angel told him, said, we heard your words the first time. We heard you as soon as you prayed. But we had some problems getting here. There was an adversary who was fighting against us. But your prayers, your prayers, your prayers. Well, I prayed today, and I guess it ain't the will of God. Why did you pray it? If you thought it was the will of God the first time, why did you pray it then? Don't we realize that the key to success in spiritual warfare is to keep on keeping on? Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on calling their name. Keep on taking it to the throne. God's working, but there's an adversary. God's working, but there's an enemy. God's working, but so is the adversary. Stand with me this morning.